ago, so I can't actually say I didn't expect to win, <laughs> so I didn't prepare anything. Uh, but when it comes to you guys giving me something, all I can say is it's entirely unnecessary. Uh, you had me at hello, <laughs> <laughs> which I mean most literally. I come out of the world of television, which um, I think Giles will agree. Hunter Thompson, the journalist, said television is a blood-filled money trench where good men go to die. <laughs> and then he added, and there is a negative aspect. <laughs> oh. 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 But I was very happy in television. I, I was there 18 years, had a really good time, uh, loved my job, until one day my boss said something to me that made it just impossible for me to continue. He said, you're fired. <laughs> So then it was a question of, of what to do next, and um, the problem is my skills were exceptionally highly developed, but they were pregnant only to the job I'd just been fired from. So I had no skills. I thought, what shall I do? I had a 15-year-old daughter, I had a mortgage, credit cards, all that kind of stuff. I thought, I know I'll write a book. I've read some, how hard can it be? <laughs> But when I say I've read some, I've read thousands of books, probably tens of thousands of books. I come from, I'm just, just old enough to come from that generation that did nothing but read books. Because uh, what the television back then was daytime only, two channels. Uh, there was nothing else to do. We had no video or anything like that, obviously, no computers, nothing like that. Everybody read. Even the, uh, the worst kids. I mean, I used to go to primary school with a knife in one pocket and a book in the other pocket. <laughs> Uh, that's how it was back then, and so I'd read all my life, I, I love to read, uh, so I thought my last chance is to write a book and see what happens. So I wrote the first book, and then I wrote the second book. And mad panic, I was broke, uh, literally I was seven months away from homelessness, the book had to sell, which it did, happily. And then after two books, I kind of took a breath and raised my head and looked around at the new world, and uh, I saw all of you people. And first of all, you are just the nicest people. Compared to television, you are definitely the nicest people. <laughs> from top to bottom, from the, uh, the bosses of the, of the big publishing companies right down to the most humble bookseller, just the nicest people, but especially my fellow authors, I discovered. And uh, what a democratic structure they instinctively established for themselves. Because all of a sudden, I was sometimes in the same room as my heroes. And the winner of previous Diamond Daggers, for instance, Ruth Randolph, who I, I read obsessively. I remember being in her hotel room in Las Vegas because she uh, she couldn't turn the bathtub off. <laughs> and you know that panic kind of feeling when the water is rising. And uh, then we had dinner, me and uh, Ruth and Ian Rankin, another uh, previous Diamond Dagger winner, just the nicest guy, Val McDermott, who uh, wrote a book that nearly estranged me from my daughter, because my, when my daughter graduated college, she got a job uh, at a cinema, which meant that she had to work on Christmas Day, which I had done plenty of times, so it was fair enough, but uh, I was sitting there at home, we were going to have our family Christmas when, when Ruth arrived back from work at about 7 o'clock, and I passed the time reading uh, A Place of Execution by Val McDermott, which was just the most sensational book. It had that kind of X factor in it that just made you never want to it made you want it to never stop. And in my particular case, it made me want me to wish my daughter would never arrive. Because <laughs> I wanted to finish the damn book. And of course, the incomparable Mr. Forsyth. Uh, I, I was one of the ones who read Day of Jackal when it came out. And um, I'm, also, I'm interested in kind of cultural history, the connection between things. Uh, for instance, the connection between the BBC sports coverage in the 1990 World Cup and subsequent CD sales of opera. Uh, that, that was gigantic. The BBC used a snippet of uh, Ness and Dormer, remember that, in, for the 1990 World Cup in Italy. CD by then was a mature medium, and we had 10 years of enormous profits out of um, Arias, and we had the three tenors and all of that stuff. None of which would have happened without some BBC researcher making that arbitrary decision. And I think Mr. Forsyth writing uh, Day of the Jackal rebooted um, certainly the thriller side of crime fiction. I think you could look at things like 
Silence of the Lambs and so on. So would Silence of the Lambs have been possible without Day of the Jackal? I don't think it would have been. So that was just year zero for my particular part of the trade. And the idea that I could be uh, not only in the same room as Freddie or introduced to him or talking to him, but to win the same award as him is utterly ludicrous. Uh, I feel completely unworthy. Uh, I think it's a particularly bad succession, Frederick Forsyth and Lee Child. Uh, you should have put somebody else in, in between. <laughs> um, but all I can say is I am deeply honored, uh, extremely grateful, and uh, I need you to know that I'm more, not so much grateful for the dagger, which I will obviously treasure forever, but much more grateful for your company, your friendship, and your willingness those 17 years ago to talk to me. So thank you very much. Uh -huh.